I'm gonna come in with the strategy. Come in with the strategy. Oh man. Got these little, I got these things here. Oh. I gotta put these away because it's a little snack. Let's do a strategy. One strategy never hurt nobody. So and we'll do another, another Spanish. Each other as India gained independence despite its best efforts, it was unable to bridge the vicious sectarian divided between Hindu, Hindus and Muslims, and he suffered a violent death at the hands of an assassin in 1948. Gandhi's influence was felt in the campaign for civil rights for blacks in the American South, where segregation and discrimination were rigidly enforced. Although the possible use of nonviolent tactics was mentioned during the interwar years, it was not <laughs> until after the Second World War that such methods were embraced and what became a remarkably successful Pain. There were obvious differences in the two settings. Gandhi was stirring up the whole Indian population against a distant imperialist power. Blacks were a minority facing an unforgiving local majority. Their predicament posing in a sharp form the underlying dilemmas facing a nonviolent strategy. The so called Jim Crow laws, named after a caricature black, caricature black from a minstrel. Show had been passed by southern legis legislators after the Civil War and were often backed by guerrilla violence. This made it extremely difficult for blacks to vote. Meant segregated facilities for eating, transportation, burial, med medical, and school faculties, and banned cohabitation, cohabitation, and marriage between. Whites and non whites, a search for goodness among the segregationists appeared a short and futile journey, and defiance could be suicidal. The barriers imposed on the ability of blacks to make their econo way economically as well as politically had undermined the Atlanta Compromise of 1895, proposed by Booker T. Washington, the wisest of my race. He had observed understand the agitation of questions of social equality as the extremist fully and said his people will work at thrift and industry, become model employees, and so gradually join American society as equals. For no race that has anything to contribute to the market to the world is long in any degree ostracized citizenship will assuredly follow, not surprising. The compromise was warmly embraced by black and white moderates, the premise that it would be hard to attain political power without economic power had some validity in practice. However, with little progress on either the economic or political front, the compromise was increasingly seen as a recipe for prolonged servitude and more radical, but also an analytical edge was provided by W.E.B. Du Bois, the first American African-American security PhD from Harvard. He had studied with Weber in Germany and the two had kept in touch. Weber considered him to be one of America's most gifted sociologists and cited him as a counterexample when challenging racial stereotypes. Du Bois undertook major research programs on the Negro problem, demonstrating the impact of political choices rather than some primordial difference between the races. He campaigned for civil rights and founded the National Association for the advancement of colored people with the support of such white reformers reformers as Jane Adams and John Dewey. In 1924, Du Bois published a critique of nonviolence by Franklin Frazier, another black and Chicago trained sociologist in the crisis. The NA the NAACP's official war again, Frazier mocked the idea of turning the other cheek in the face of violence. This was just after an anti lynching law had been Philly bustered out of the Senate, demonstrating that the Southern white establishment condoned racist murder as a way of, as a way of intimidating blacks. 
Responding to Fraser's, the white Quaker Ellen Windsor pointed to Gandhi and wondered whether a similar figure could arise in this country to lead people out of their misery and ignorance, not by the old way of brute force which brings sorrow and wrong, but by the new methods of education based on economic justice leading straight to freedom. A rejoinder came from Fraser. Suppose there should arise a Gandhi to lead Negroes without hating their hearts to stop tilling the fields of the South under the peonage system to seizing pain to cease paying taxes to states that keep their children in ignorance and to ignore the uniquitous dis disenfranchisement and Jim Crow laws. I fear we would witness an unprecedented massacre of defenseless black men and women in the name of law and order there would be scarcely and there would scarcely be enough Christian sentiment in America to lay the flood of blood, to, to stay the flood of blood. When a few years later, Du Bois invited and received an article from Gandhi, he added his own observation, agitation, not lying to physical cooperate with what became Gandhi's watchword, and with it, he is leading all India to freedom. Here and today, he stretches out his hand in fellowship to his colored friends of the West. Du Bois focused more on Gandhi's readiness to engage in direct action and his refusal to yield to oppression than on his underlying philosophy. On that, he remained skeptical as other American black activists started to talk of Gandhian campaigns. Du Bois pointed out how taxes to fasting, public prayer, and self sacrifice were early to the United States but had been bred into the very bone of India for more than 3,000 years. Gandhi never visited the United States but to his political importance, to its own cause, gaining independence from the British, and also the potential relevance of his ideas to the divisions within American society. The initial impetus of contact with Gandhi was not specifically 